grown all over these mountains, is one of the weirdest plants you'll ever see. It's a strange type of giant maize that grows up to 20 feet tall. These disconcerting finger-like things are its roots, suspended meters off the ground, and they ooze with a gooey mucus. And it's this mysterious mucus that could help feed the planet and end farming's toxic reliance on chemical fertilizers. This is the holy grail. As long as scientists can crack its code. This is the town of Totontepec in southern Mexico. For centuries, possibly even millennia, this maze has been meticulously cared for by the indigenous farmers there. Nos contaron nuestros antepasados, nuestros abuelos que pues el maíz lleva mucho más de 2000 años. Empecé a cultivar de los 13 años. Jugábamos con esa gelatina que daba pues la raíz desde muy pequeño pues no no sabíamos qué tenía o por qué se le salía. Para nosotros este significa mucho nuestra semilla Es bueno, no tienen otros pueblos, otros países como de nosotros. But word about this mysterious giant corn eventually reached the ears of curious scientists. One of those was Howard Yana Shapiro, who was living in Oaxaca all the way back in 1980. I hear they have giant maize. So the word giant maize, you know, kind of intrigued me. The, the maize that was growing was 16 to 18 feet tall. You know, a normal maze that you see across America might be eight to 10 feet tall, but this was gigantic. I, I just couldn't believe it. Seeing something that was mythical, and in many ways it was mythical. On the surface of the roots, in a period when a maize plant would need nitrogen for that explosive growth, there was a mucilaginous material, really thick, very viscous. And we would watch it and it would auto dose itself essentially. And this mucus appeared to be allowing the plant to self-fertilize, meaning the farmers barely needed to add any artificial fertilizer. The idea that a maize plant could make its own nitrogen sounded like science fiction to virtually everyone we talked to. And to understand the reason why, you're gonna have to get used to a very important term. Nitrogen fixation, nitrogen fixation, nitrogen fixation. Nitrogen is essential to all plants. It's a major component of all proteins and chlorophyll. We're literally surrounded by nitrogen. The air is 78% nitrogen. Great, except it's not because almost all plants apart from legumes can't convert this lovely nitrogen from the atmosphere into the ammonia that it can actually use. And the reason this is such high stakes is about way more than corn. The world's population is literally fueled by cereal grains. Wheat, corn, rice, sorghum, millet, barley. These make up more than 50% of the world's diet and none of them can fix their own nitrogen. So we spray huge amounts of nitrogen rich fertilizer to plug the gap great for delivering bigger yields and helping to feed the planet's 8 billion people. Terrible for the environment. Unfortunately, most plants, uh, when we apply the fertilizer, only take up about half of it. It pollutes the water table. There's huge eutrophic sections of the Gulf of Mexico, which are dead zones caused by nitrogen. And that's not all. Fertilizer isn't cheap. So in some parts of the world, farmers can't even use fertilizers at all, meaning lower yields and less food to feed people. Wouldn't this be great if you didn't have to apply nitrogen in ammonia form? Wouldn't it be great if this impacted the production in the global south where they don't have access to fertilizer particularly? Hell yes. So you have a scientific motivation, you have an ecological motivation, you have a financial motivation. All of these come together when you try to solve a systematic problem. So. That's the prize. But it's time to go back to Mexico. Mexico is the birthplace of corn, home to more than 50 varieties. But the one with the ability to fertilize itself is called Oloton. And even in Mexico, this remained a relatively well-kept secret for centuries. When Howard first came across it in 1980, it still took him nearly 30 years to get the right team together to study it. So we started working with the community. We started doing all the kind of research. Let's establish facts. And we engaged the community extensively. We built a lab there. We had people from the community actually working for us. Together with Mexican scientists and the town of Totontepec, they studied how this slimy mucigel helps the plant to self-fertilize and grow so tall. They found that it's packed with nitrogen-fixing bacteria usually found in the soil. The gel itself acts like a sort of shield, creating a low oxygen environment that allows the bacteria to convert atmospheric nitrogen into a form the plant can actually use. This allows the plant to take up to 80% of the nitrogen it needs directly from the air. 
Finally, after a decade of research, there was proof of the agricultural holy grail, a self-fertilizing cereal crop. But almost immediately, some people started to ask, who owns the rights to an amazing plant like this? Some even went much further, labeling it as an example of what's known as biopiracy. So biopiracy is basically the idea that there is a misappropriation of biodiversity for research or the development of commercial products. And I always talk about this by thinking about Indiana Jones, right? So the idea that then, you know, somebody could swoop in to, uh, you know, biodiversity rich country, take a few plants, swoop out and discover the cure for cancer um, and make a lot of money. And um, yeah, and it was kind of, that was a happy ending, right? well wrong. Uh, and a lot of countries are saying, actually, this biodiversity is located within our countries. And it's intrinsically linked to the culture and lifestyles of a lot of our indigenous peoples and local communities. So what does all this mean when it comes to Olaton? In, in Mexico, uh, an agreement was negotiated between a company and a local community in a way to secure uh, prior informed consent for this research um, and also to agree on sharing uh, some of the potential benefits. Every time that one seed is sold, half the value of the royalty goes to the community. Para mí es bueno porque de ahí aprendemos que el maíz de nuestro pueblo es el mejor del mundo porque últimamente no lo sabíamos. Como tanto nosotros como ellos también aprenden porque vienen a investigar acá muchas cosas y es bueno pues Tener algo que nos den algo. The village has been instrumental. We could have never done what we've done without them. They've been all in the whole way. It's fair to say that some are still definitely wary, especially because the agreement itself remains confidential. But in a way, all of this only matters if this scientific marvel can actually deliver on its promise, because it's not made any money just yet. Because for all the tantalizing promise of this self-fertilizing corn, farmers aren't going to grow it on a massive scale unless it can compete with current industrial scale corn. So researchers are currently crossbreeding it with other varieties, hoping to transfer some of its unique properties. They've already managed to almost halve the amount of time it takes to grow, and they've made huge progress on fixing nitrogen too. We can now fix about 40% of the nitrogen uh, from the air from just the local bacteria in the fields in the United States. So this this plant is recruiting the bacteria to fix nitrogen from the air, and 40% is a good amount. Probably three or four generations away from a stabilized hybrid maize. But the future of this is not just about corn. So now the scenario is nitrogen fixing maize, nitrogen fixing rice. What's next? Wheat? Then let's do millet, which is used in many parts of the world. How about barley? All of that is open now for discussion. In a perfect world, all crops would, would fix their own nitrogen and we would reduce the amount of fertilizer that we need. So the future for nitrogen fixing cereal crops is looking bright. Hopefully in my lifetime, nitrogen fixing maize commercially available around the world. But in our increasingly monocultural world, the fact that a little-known maize from a misty mountain in rural Mexico has been kept alive by small-scale indigenous farmers and could now help tackle world hunger points to another inescapable thing. We cannot talk about biodiversity as something separate than people. People use biodiversity, people care for biodiversity, people depend on biodiversity. And, you know, the idea that there is this wealth of knowledge and possibilities around biodiversity is really such a wonderful connection between people and nature. And we must find a way to be able to tap into this potential in a way that we are all benefiting. Because as much as the science is amazing, it's equally amazing that it's only thanks to this small community in the mountains of Oaxaca, who have preserved this rare plant with such care, that we're even able to get excited about it at all. At Oxford University, Dr. Mark Fricker is one of a team of botanists and computer scientists studying a species of slime mold called Physarum polycephalum. For years, slime molds have fascinated scientists with their remarkable ability to solve simple mazes. Put food at the end of a maze and the slime mold will find the quickest route through. 
But scientists started to wonder if the mole could do more than just perform clever tricks. You can set them lots of little tasks and uh, you can allow them to forage and connect up little food sources to see what sort of network they would make. Okay. And a geometric shape, so a square or, a, or something more complicated, yeah. is interesting. But we wanted to see whether they would be able to solve a slightly more complex problem. Mark is recreating an experiment he worked on with colleagues at Tokyo University. He takes a blob of slime mold and then surrounds it with a pattern of oat flakes, an irresistible treat to the slime mold. What happens next is recorded by a time-lapse camera. The slime mold locates the oat flakes by drawing out in all directions. But within hours, the slime mold shrinks back leaving an intricate web of tubes that connect the oat flakes. It's these tubes that transfer nutrients around the slime mold. Incredibly, everything you can see is part of one single cell. It needs to build a network that's quite efficient to transport all those resources around. At the same time, that network mustn't cost too much. It right, mustn't take right. up too many yeah. of its own resources. And then the other problem it has is it's, uh, it's going to be subject to damage. And so if there was only ever one connection, there's a risk that that would break.